Jen, it's great to see you again. It's been a couple of weeks since we last spoke. How are you doing? Yeah, good to speak as well, Steve. I was going to say good to see you. I guess I am over visual um, contact here. But um, yeah, it's good. Uh, not much has changed, I guess. Still house ridden and uh, trying my best to train for the Olympics in a year's time. What about you? Yeah, much the same boat. I remember the last time we spoke, you know, was just before the games were officially postponed. And, you know, we were discussing whether it was going to happen and if it was going to happen, what we were going to do. So, yeah, I, I guess I'd love to know, you know, what, what has that decision meant for you? I know that you and your coach, Nick Bado are, are very meticulous planners and you were in such great shape early this year. Now, with the official postponement of the games next year, how are you, how are you approaching life these days? Yeah, so I guess that was, yeah, well, that was the last time we were chatting, um, predicting whether the Olympic Games would be pushed or not. So a lot has changed since then in regards to planning and, and how we're going about um, this next phase. Uh, like you said, Nick, uh, my coach, is, is very good at um, kind of organising us all and working out a plan from here. Uh, but because things had been so delayed and, and were up in the air for quite some time, uh, we kind of just had to drop back into that, that phase of base training. You know, we're so far out again, uh, all over again. It's now um, another year of, of training and getting stronger and fitter again. So we've definitely upped the Ks. Well, for me, I've upped the Ks, uh, pulled back intensity, and Nick's kind of just got us in this mode of, um, you know, if this is a holding pattern now, it could be a while. Let's not get overworked. We don't want to get mentally drained out and burnt out. So we've been in close contact in the sense that we report to him once a week uh, correspondence and he just feeds us information if he hears it from around the world. And um, yeah, just keeping things very, very simple for now um, and not kind of overthinking at all. And we still don't know when the next race is, obviously, but uh, we're definitely in a, in a place now where if we hear of something coming up in the near future, we'll, we will be ready to go. Um, it'll just be, you know, getting ready to sharpen up for it. Fantastic. Fantastic. I have found myself in, in a similar position there. It's like, I, I, I took a couple of weeks off after, um, after the, the announcement. I just needed that mental break. I think one of the things that I found difficult about the postponement was just the time of year it came, you know, we were just preparing for nationals that, that following week. And I had so yeah. much kind of emotion and adrenaline, yeah. like putting up towards those championships. And I, I, I just knew that I needed a bit of time off mentally. Um, yeah. Once, I, once we out about the games. I think that's really smart because uh, like I said, um, I'm acting like this has all been very simple and straightforward, but there was definitely that period, like you said, where we were meant to be at our Olympic trials. Um, and, and I kind of had those few weeks of a lull where I'm like, what now? I lacked a little bit of motivation. I, I remember I went out and did a K session and, and Nick texted me after and said, how was it? And I, I just said, look, I feel like I was lacking a bit of motiva motivation out there. Um, but I guess in saying all of this, um, with the postponement of the Olympics, um, you know, do you think this is something that can help Aussies? Um, we've got quite a bit of time up our sleeve now. Is this a beneficial sort of um, position that we've been put in? Definitely. I, I think it does present an interesting opportunity for Australians. You know, we're one of the only countries who have had the opportunity to compete this year. And, you know, we were all planning the last three years around getting ourselves in shape. Yeah. And, you know, we, we did have a little, little bit of a domestic season to, to use as a test to see how that plan was working. So I think there are a lot of athletes who will be able to take that experience that we were able to have, or, although it was a short one, and say, I was right, you know, I was running personal best, mm -hmm. you know, I was fit, I was healthy, it was working for me. Let me try and replicate that, although in a compressed fashion next year with the postponement. And then there are going to be other athletes in the community who will use the opportunity to almost get a free pass and say, oh, I wasn't ready. Uh, yeah. for the games and you know what I've now got this this gift given to me and I'm going to make sure that I do things a little bit differently towards next year so I do think that it does present a good opportunity how I'm looking at it is I was feeling like I was in really good shape so I was kind of looking at this as okay let's almost replicate uh, but in a compressed version because if I can get myself in a similar similar position to where I was this year I know that I'll be uh, ready for a great run in Tokyo um, yeah, there's definitely two sides. Um, like you said, it, it can help people that weren't quite ready or maybe unfortunately hit a little patch of injuries. Um, and for the people that were ready to go, they can kind of learn from what worked for them and, and to use it again. But I know that last time me and you were speaking, we were saying timing is everything and being in athletics, um, 
you know, the nature of the sport is unfortunately you do get injured a lot. So it's just, I think, going to be one of those things where you've got time now to map it out. Um, but the hardest thing is, um, you know, getting it right all over again. I think one of the things I'm thinking about at this point in time is just this extended base season. You, you, you said a little bit earlier that you were kind of going back into a bit of a base, you know, dropping the intensity. Um, that's something I've been thinking about as well because I wasn't planning on going back into a base season before the Olympics. Um, yeah. <laughs> as a 400 meter runner, my base work was pretty much done in February and the rest of the time was about, you know, getting the speed in the legs. So now I've had to go back to what, what could be, you know, another 12 months of base and, I was speaking with my coach, Penny Gillies, around that thought. And, you know, one of the things that we spoke a lot about was making sure that we have fun with the training during this time, because there is so much uh, uncertainty around, like you were saying, not knowing when the next race is going to be, finding motivation for that. Have you, have you found that kind of creep in, the idea of, like, balancing that, like, work and intensity and play aspect to, to the sport? Yeah, uh, definitely. And I think that's where my coach has a lot of experience, um, before all this happened, I kind of was like, yeah, this is fine. I can just go into my base training that I would normally do in November, week in and week out. Um, I'm fine with, you know, working out how to do my gym at home. Um, you know, this will be easy. But I, I did find that um, motivation is really hard when, when things are pushed and your whole goal and mindset is changed. Um, and so what Nick's done for us, um, even though we're used to running a lot, we're used to the high mileage, we're used to this base work, um, it can get really uh, tedious for us. So Nick's kind of gone in and said, rather than going out and doing eight by a K every Tuesday on one minute rest, he's um, now giving us a bit of fartlek. So we have kind of, um, you know, minute workloads. So for example, on Tuesday, we did three minute, two minute, one minute by four. Um, and it, it's kind of sounds strange, maybe coming from a distance runner, they'll understand, but that was exciting for us. You know, we haven't done that before. So Ryan and I went out and did that session and afterwards we felt like we'd really accomplished something because we were motivated in all the reps rather than just going out and trying to hit your times for eight by a K. And I think for coaches right now, that's super important to keep the minds of their athletes fresh and focused and motivated because um, it's a slippery slope when you're trying to uh, work so hard day in and day out. You could, you know, get a month down the track and realize you're completely burnt out. And, and that can actually take longer to get out of than an injury sometimes. So um, I think advice should be taken uh, from both our coaches because they seem to know that you can't just keep, you know, turning up every day doing the same old thing. It does get stale and it's so important to change things up, make it a little bit fun, uh, throw in challenges here and there or change the week around, which, you know, you're not used to because it can be vital in a, in a phase like this. Definitely. I, I don't know if you, you sometimes find yourself doing what I tend to do when, when I'm not in great shape and that's compare myself to different points in time. And when you're running the same sessions all the time, you know, those comparisons are easy to make and sometimes they don't help at times like this. You find yeah. that oh, oh. I'm a shocker. I have everything that I've done with Nick Bideau since 2013 written day by day. Uh, so any session he gives me, I'll find it somewhere in my notes um, and compare. So it's so important yeah, to change it up and do something that isn't necessarily measurable in any way other than your own effort. Um, yeah. It really, really helps. But um, moving on into like all this talk about the Olympic Games, um, with it being scheduled next year, this obviously changes uh, a lot of the schedule. This now has the World Championships that were meant to be in Oregon next year, pushed a year later. Um, given 2022 was meant to be uh, the Commonwealth Games year, um, how are you approaching this with now the next two years in front of you? Um, there's going to be a few major championships on top of each other. Uh, are you planning on turning up to every single one? Uh, periodization obviously is going to come into it. Like what's your, what's your goal for this? It's, it's such a good question. Um, and, and, and in, in absolute honesty, it's not one that I've thought of too much recently. It's, you know, the way that my mind's working at the moment is just trying to work out what my plan is going to be for Tokyo next year. Yeah. And then I think I'll, you know, draw again that plan uh, for the for the World Championships and Commonwealth Games. But I mean, it's going to be it's going to be interesting. I, you know, I, the only other time that I can really think about w what feels similar to having two major championships close in close proximity, and that's probably the time I was in in college and, and going through the collegiate season and then going on to the professional season afterwards. And I know that you have something similar. What about yourself? How are you thinking about 
about uh, the idea of doubling up with the World Championships and, and, and then a few weeks later, the Commonwealth Games. Yeah, I think similar to what you said, obviously, uh, with the way this year panned out, I think I should probably just focus on the first thing ahead of me. And like you said, that's Tokyo. Um, but I'm kind of excited to have such a jam-packed two years. We are lucky uh, being a Commonwealth country. We do have a major championship every year. It's not like uh, the Americans where they have like an off year. Um, but also in saying that being a distance runner, there's actually a lot more coming up. I mean, I don't know if you're planning on going to the world indoors, but that's next year as being pushed. Um, then they're having the first world cross country, well, not the first, but the world cross country in Australia, which is, I think a week after, um, or maybe before the world champ. Yeah. The world indoors. So those two championships, I know there's a lot of athletes that want to do both, like Stewie McSwain, he'd want to do uh, indoors and cross country. Um, so yeah. that's something that I would be looking at. And then we've got the Olympics coming up. So next year is hectic. But like you said, with, with 2022 and them being so, with the world champs and the Commonwealth Games being so close, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever had to jump that close other than, like you said, in college. I remember I flew home in 2012 for... Um, the Olympic trials and then flew back just in time for indoor um, national champs. But I mean, again, that scale is much lower than what we're talking here with, with the world championships and the Commonwealth games. So I think the biggest thing is having our coaches sit down and work out how are we going to uh, do this peak? Um, the good thing is when they're that close, you can just peak as if it's one championship because one one week, give or take, uh, for me as a distance runner, isn't isn't too difficult. It's more when you're trying to peak April and then again in August. So it'll just be about restructuring our year, maybe pushing everything a bit later and and holding that base phase for a while, and then really sharpening up towards the middle of the year. So I think we've got a lot of interesting um, months ahead of us, but. Uh, I think these next two years can definitely be uh, two of the biggest years for Australian athletes, uh, along with a lot of others. Yeah, I, I really like the the point that you bring up of like condensing the competition schedules. We've got World Indoors next year, World Cross Country, Olympic Games, and then Commonwealth Games, World Championships. And what that potentially could mean for young Australian athletes, you know, to, to make it up to a senior team is something that we as Australians sometimes have as an easier path than some of our North American friends. Um, and I think there's a lot of value to being able to be exposed to that senior level of competition before you might be really ready for it. Because I, I think it really kind of wakes you up into um, what the best in the world level is and what's required and how to do it. So I think it's, you know, we've got a good junior program coming through and obviously with the potential postponement or even cancellation of the world juniors this year, I think that you make an excellent point. The next 24 months uh, present enormous opportunity for those juniors of ours to, to step up into senior teams and get it both experience and get really quick experience and then build yeah. on that at, at, at future teams. Um, I want to bring you back to, to something that we were talking about a little bit ago, which was kind of the U S experience. Yeah. Uh, we both had it. Um, you, you yourself are a Gator and I know that you've got, uh, a very strong connection back to Florida and I myself was at Stanford and Duke. I think, you know, how, what, how do you speak about, you know, your time in America with, with Australians these days and how do you advise uh, young up and coming juniors, whether the American experience is, is a good move for them to make? Yeah, I think now with, with the knowledge we have, um, especially going through it all and, and now just, I think if it's just social media in general, but Back when I accepted my scholarship, I hadn't really heard much about uh, Australians going over to America. It had um, been more of this um, new sort of idea to me where I was encouraged by everyone around me to do it. It sounded like an amazing opportunity, but it was scary because I didn't know of many people that had done it and it had been really successful for. Um, my parents were very eager just because of the free education. They thought, you know, at least try it for that reason, even if running doesn't pan out the way you want it to. Um, so in that sense, you know, I jumped in not thinking that I would end up becoming an Olympian after it and, and a pro athlete. But in this day and age, I can't see why you wouldn't take that opportunity. I just think um, from experience, it was the best decision I ever made, uh, mainly for, um, having a free 
education. Like I got a, a bachelor in applied physiology and kinesiology, came out of it with no debt whatsoever and was also able to train and live out my running dream at the same time. And I think for a lot of athletes, that's the biggest struggle, especially in Australia. There isn't any format that kind of supports that trying to transition to being a professional runner, but also trying to study. It's really difficult. Whereas uh, this college system allows you to do both really well. And, um, you know, I'm grateful that I got the opportunity. I'm so glad I picked such a, an awesome school. Uh, I don't think you can go too wrong uh, in America, but it is definitely something that uh, when young kids uh, send emails or parents send emails asking for advice, I just say, look, obviously do your research, make sure you know where you're going and if it's the right fit for you. Um, but if I can tell you yes or no, well, I'm definitely all for it. I think it's a great experience. Um, did you have a similar sort of uh, feeling when you finished college? Is it something you would recommend to anyone? Definitely. I, I agree completely about the idea of it just being a life experience beyond anything athletic. It's, you know, it's so different from what we have here is from in Australia, you know, the idea that everyone lives on campus in America, you know, you're really kind of put outside of your comfort zone of having to mix with new people from not just another country, but everyone uh, in the state seems to come from all over the America yeah. into, into the one hub of university. And then, yeah. and then the athletic side is, is just another ex experience to, to be around, you know, professional athletes among so many different sports. I know that, uh, I'm sure you would have gotten a lot of energy from the the football team, and and I remember doing the same uh, at Stanford, and just being able to feed off, you know, these incredibly talented athletes, you know, be it in in track and field or, or another sport. I think that's one thing. Anyone listening who, who hasn't been to America, it's called track, uh, track and field in America. Yeah. If you say track athletics, not athletics, America, that's you. everything. Athletics think, is the yeah. whole department of sport, which yeah. confused me a lot. But um, what's interesting with you, Steve, is did you go over to college with the mindset of what you wanted to study? See, I went over there with no idea. I was kind of thinking, um, I'll go try this out for you and then I'll come home because I know I'm not going to like it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Whereas I think you really made the most of uh, college in the sense that um, you obviously ran very well, but you also got a really interesting degree. So I think that's interesting for our viewers to hear um, yeah. really your education side of college. Definitely. I think I'll, I'll spend, you know, two minutes giving a little background on how I got there. You were, you were saying that, you know, the free education, your parents kind of seeing that as a golden opportunity. How I ended up in America was, um, again, I really didn't know much about it. Like the time that I was starting off, there weren't too many Australians over through the collegiate system and especially sprinters. Uh, there were a couple of distance runners, but, but no sprinters. And, the idea of how I got there really came from wanting to pursue medicine here in Australia and finishing up my, uh, my high school days and going to the university that I was hoping to apply for and kind of explaining that I was finishing high school in 2011. There was a big event next year in the Olympic Games in 2012 that, you know, although I was 18 at the time, still was, was looking to, to, to put my best foot forward at. And and asking if it was if it was possible to do both. Was it really possible to combine study and athletics in Australia? And the expression that I got back from the kind of admissions office was kind of that of a ghost. Like, there's no way that you can start. You have to start in January. You can't start at another time of year. You can't do the medical degree part-time. And everything was just, you know, around that red area of it's not going to work. So I remember coming home to my parents and telling them that I was in a midlife crisis as <laughs> any dramatic 18-year-old would. At 18, yeah. And... Um, <laughs> And I think my mother was going through my school bag and found all these letters of interest from, from American colleges. And kind of to explain that, you know, track and field's a nice sport where um, others like sports such as soccer or, or tennis or something, you've really got to send in video of you playing. Whereas athletic was so, you know, quantitative, you know, they, yeah. the colleges can pull up the top list and look, you know, who in the world is running what times where and, yeah. and express interest in them to come over to the state. So, the only address they could get of mine was my school address, my high school address. So I used to get letters from a whole bunch of colleges kind of introducing themselves in their programs. Um, and I remember I had such blinders on when I, when I first got these letters that, that I really didn't pay attention to them. Yeah. But after going through that, that experience uh, at the school and, and realizing that the university system wasn't going to meet my, my goals and needs here, I started looking into the U S college. And once I started seeing the times that they were running, you know, the NCAA meets probably this, 
the most competitive in some events um, or, or if not second most competitive event in the world in any given year. Um, it's quite phenomenal. And then kind of packaged all together. I, um, I ended up in the States and again, went into America thinking that medicine was still what I wanted to do, but actually enjoyed my time so much around the Silicon Valley area of Stanford and really got into kind of an entrepreneurial mindset and, and have since left the idea of going into medicine and, and he's very, and, and I'm now very firmly, uh, in the world of business. And I, I currently work at Uber on the Uber Eats side of the business doing, uh, cool. doing some consulting work to the big enterprise chain. So like you're saying, the opportunity in, in, in America is great. And it's definitely one that like you, I would, uh, encourage young, young Australian athletes to, to look at maybe not, yeah, totally. you know, maybe it's not right for them, but it's, it's certainly worth looking yeah. at. I think you just, yeah, you got to know where you're going and make sure you pick something that suits you. Like I probably couldn't have gone to an, uh, school in the northeast that it was going to snow the whole time um i've I come would, I, you know i grew up on the gold coast i'm a queenslander i ended up going to florida somewhere very similar um you've definitely got to know what you're gonna thrive in rather than um kind of be miserable definitely and then when you finish you know you finished in 2012 jen and i remember um your your great run at the NCAA championships is your last race with florida you then went pro afterwards. Can you maybe talk us a little bit through, like, is that something you obviously going into college weren't really thinking of it, but when it, when did you really decide that, that going pro was right for you and something that you wanted to do? Yeah, I, I honestly, it was something that was just so late in the game um, with me, maybe because uh, I always say this, I wasn't a, a superstar in high school. I was very good and I would go to nationals and I, in cross country, I would always finish in the top three in Athletics, I was thereabouts, but again, I was no superstar. I wasn't breaking records. Uh, so when I went to college, um, I really developed a lot. Uh, I uh, my main focus was cross country. I was definitely better at the longer stuff. I did the five thousand at NCAA's that year uh, on track. Um, but then I kind of gradu uh, gradually found the steeplechase. I was kind of put in it by accident, really, because we didn't have anyone else that would do it, and I really enjoyed it. But again, I only probably did it a few times each year just when we needed points in the event at conference or something. Um, but by my junior year, um, I started to really find um, myself in the sense that I really started to love running. It was, it didn't seem like training anymore. I'd done all my hard uh, subjects for university kind of earlier in the game. Uh, my freshman and sophomore year were really jam packed with all the hard stuff. So I'd planned it well accidentally. That way I had a lot of uh, free time to do the little one percenters. And from my junior to senior year, I just made such a jump. And it wasn't until my senior year where I thought the Olympics was something that I could definitely um, make if I put my mind to it. But again, like I was so far off the A standard right through in uh, outdoor season. And it wasn't until nationals where I thought, you know, if I run this right and I aim to win, the qualifying time should come um, with it. And again, while I was thinking all about the Olympics, it still wasn't sinking in that post Olympics, I would go professional and become a professional athlete and, and, and run and train as my job. But it all just organically kind of developed when I got the A standard for the Olympics and ended up being selected and going to the Olympic games that just opened the door of opportunities to where I realized I could get a manager and I could get a sponsor. And even though it was, you know, a very minimal contract, it was enough to allow me to live this dream and keep, pursuing running and, and travel around the world racing. So I definitely didn't plan my, you know, my four year plan wasn't go to college, make the Olympics, go pro. It all just happened in a span of a few months where one door opened to another door. And the next thing I knew I was, um, you know, running professionally on the European circuit and I haven't stopped doing that since. So I was very, very lucky with timing. And um, that's why when kids ask, you know, is this something you've dreamed about? And I, I always say like, this life is obviously a dream come true, but this is something that I hadn't written down in the books um, to get me, you know, I need to do this, this and this to get me to where I want to be in 2012. It just all gradually happened. And I think mainly it was because I loved the sport. I loved what I did. Um, it never felt like work to me. And um, you know, that's where it got me today. And I think you've got to enjoy what you're doing. You've got to love this sport because it's not easy. It's an individual sport at the end of the day. And, um, you know, passion for what you do is always going to get you there. 
Definitely. You could, uh, that was, I, I really enjoyed listening to that because I, like, I think, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of Australian athletes who, who find themselves in athletic do, do a lot of different sports growing up. Uh, I was, I was no, no different there. And, you know, the decision to go pro in athletics, it's not something that you have to make at a very young age. You know, it's something no. that you can take in your stride as you mature, um, as you find the event that that's ultimately the right fit for you. Um, and and then yeah, the the wonderful opportunities that there are to to travel the world and 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 inspire a, a bunch of generations on on what it's like to to be in a professional athlete and to continue this great sport that that we have in, in athletics. I know that we're um, coming short on time, so what I'd love to do, Jen, is we've got three kind of quick fun questions to to finish it off. Yeah. Um, I'd love to know, or I guess the athletic community would love to know, what is your favourite running related moment? Um, I have two. Uh, I'm always asked this and I wish I could narrow it, narrow it down to one, but I'm not complaining. I would say the Rio Olympics uh, is one because I made two finals for the first time and PB three times out of four races. It was just a seven days jam packed with 40 laps of the track and it just felt like every time I touched the track, I just knew I was going to PB or place really well or do something um, magical. So I can um, never express in words what those seven days meant to me, just also with my development as an athlete. I think they have enabled me to get through the last four years of injury, uh, just that feeling alone. Um, and it definitely is what I hang my hat on so far um, with you know what I've accomplished. And the second one is 10 days after the, those magical races, I went out and got the Australian record in the 3000 meter steeplechase. Um, again, another memory that I'll never be able to express in words really, because it was one of those races where you just, you're running around the track. You're not even looking at the clock. You're not even taking in anything around you. You just, you just feel good. You're almost like a robot. And when I crossed the line and saw the time and knew it was an Australian record, I was like, how did that happen? Like I thought the track was short for a minute. Um, and it was just one of those moments that I'll cherish forever. Um, and I can remember it crystal clear. I just got, I just got goosebumps when you, you were <laughs> that moment of crossing the line. I think that's, that's kind of the best feeling, isn't it? Where you don't even remember anything yeah. in the race. You're just so tuned in. Everything's like you said, robotic. And, and then you, to, to, to have an achievement and, and a two week period like that, that's, that's a fantastic memory. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, Do you want me to go one for one? Can I give you a question? Yeah, sure. Um, what is your favorite type of training at the track? This is a really good question. Um, it probably changes at different times in the year, but I love the feeling uh, just as I'm coming into a championship when I'm really strong, if I've had a really good winter, se winter season and I'm, I'm coming, I'm fit and I'm just developing that speed. I love doing like a fast lactic workout where I'll do something along the lines of, you know, I'd run a couple of 150 reps at the start uh, to really get my, my speed going and getting the legs ticking. And then we'd probably hit a really hard 300 and try and almost run a PB 300. And then I'll back after that up with very short recovery and run 100. Um, and I'm in oh. such a world of pain afterwards. But I think why I love that session so much is from there, I can, with a pretty high degree of confidence, know where I am um, in terms of race condition. And yeah. I think that's always an exciting time for me because it's been a while since I've, I've PB'd. It, it, I haven't run a a PB since uh, London 2012. And there have been so many different points between uh, then and now where I knew that I was in the right shape, but just not able to, yeah. to get it out of myself. So that's a great session for me to, to know where I am, to then go and give me the confidence to run, you know, 44 seconds in a race, which is, um, which is something that you, you can only do when you're, you're ready to put yourself on the line. Um, yeah, the old feel good right. sessions, you know, when you're ready to rock, when you can complete that that's session. It. That's it. <laughs> All right, we got. I got one more for you, Jen. Yeah. Um, I know. That you, I know that you spend a lot of time out, outside of Australia. You've been um, traveling the world for a number of years now, following the Diamond League circuit and doing different training camps. I know you had a a, a base in Mount Laguna, um, and then you spend a lot of time in in Spain as well. Where's your favorite place uh, outside of Australia to train? Yeah, that actually is a good question because. There are so many awesome places that we've been. Um, before I got a chronic Achilles injury, I would have said Mount Laguna in America, um, but there is no flat surface. You're either running directly up or directly down. 
Um, so I'd have to say London. That's our second base. We actually spend um, probably the most amount of time in one spot in Teddington. Um, so that just is a, very, a place very close to me. It's a second home. Um, uh, we know all the, like, we have friends there, locals, you know, your cafes, your restaurants, places that we go a lot. And the training is just awesome. You've got Bushy Park. Uh, we've got St. Mary's Track, which we use, the gym there as well. We've got Richmond Park for all our long runs. There's just kind of so much around to keep you, um, you know, motivated the whole time. It never gets boring or tedious or, um, you know, it's it's one of those places where we turn up to London and in June or whenever we go there, it's kind of like we almost feel at like home. Um, and leaving is sad because, you know, it's going to be, again, six months till we're back. So I would say London has a very close place in my heart and also from the London Olympics, like what a memorable few weeks there. So that would definitely be up there with my best places. But what I'll do is I know you have to go. So I'll ask you one last question because I think it is a very important question. Um, I'm also very interested in your answer. Uh, what advice can you give for upcoming middle distance athletes who are struggling mentally with injuries? It's, it's a really good question to end on. Um, you know, I have had a lot of injuries throughout my career and, you know, track and field is one of those sports where it's, um, it's different from, from an AFL or a soccer where you can kind of play through an injury or you can still have a season uh, if you get injured at, at different parts. You know, an injury to track and field usually is a season ending injury, whether it's a, a bone injury. Um, I've had a num number of stress injuries uh, in my bones and, or a muscle injury. I, I tore my hamstring in 2014, uh, the semifinal of the Commonwealth Games that, that I needed surgery on. So, you know, from, from how I get through it, you know, I think athletics builds an enormous amount of resilience in you uh, to begin with, because, you know, if you have the right people around you, um, you know, it, it just becomes something that you do. It's, it doesn't really become um, something that you have to make the decision to do. It's just something that you do. Uh, it just comes naturally to you and you don't have to put too much more thought into it. So I think I've always been able to rebound from my injuries, both believing in my ability on what I can do on the track and London making the Olympic final in London certainly gave me a lot of confidence into what it takes uh, to, to get to the top, top in the world and, and what that feeling's like uh, to be there and the motivation to get going is, has, has never really changed uh, through, throughout the years. I think what has really kind of been, been a big blessing for me is just having the right people around me uh, at those important times of injury. Um, you know, I'm very grateful that I've got an incredibly supportive family uh, to go through the journey with and who can kind of feel my pain when I'm injured. And I've got a great uh, friendship network, a uh, group of friends who, again, you know, are able to celebrate my success and, you know, feel it like their own when things are going well, but also kind of take some of the, the stress and anxiety of, of my injuries when, when things aren't going so well. So I think that's what I put it down to is kind of the support network that I've managed to build for myself. And that's both on the track and off the track. I think it's so important through the good times, but, but what I found is even more important through, that, through the difficult times and um, creating that network and being able to share success with a group of people is, um, is something that I love when things are going well and, and need when things aren't going well. So yeah. great question to end on. Yeah, I think like you said, what stood out um, what you, from what you just said is the three things. It's um, finding a moment that can keep you motivated during those hard times. And for you, that's London. Like I said, for Re uh, my Rio performance, that's what's got me these through these last four years, um, having something to like always strive towards and know what it's like to be your best and, and that feeling of, of getting it right. Um, that's what powers me through those terrible dark moments, but also the support system. If you don't have people around you that believe you in the dark times and just want to be there for the, for the high moments, um, that's the game changer. Uh, for me, it's my husband. I've got Ryan beside me who's been through that terrible phase of injuries as well. And, and when you have someone believing in you and saying, you know, get through this you once you get through this you'll be fine you'll get back to where you need to be um i think it's just you know makes it so much easier because you can obviously believe in yourself as much as possible but having someone else give you that sort of belief as well is fundamental in in making a return to something that is so hard at the best of times um so that's really important definitely definitely jen it's been so great chatting thank you to everyone who's uh sent questions for us i really enjoyed the conversation how did you find it 
Yeah, it was good. I wish we could um, cover all the ones that came in. But uh, again, I think there were some great questions asked and definitely very informative um, hearing from both of us because we've had different paths as well. Even though we've had a lot of common ground with, with college and everything, we've also been able to kind of show a little bit of variety with the different events and, and how we've approached, you know, what's happened and, and what we've got ahead. So thanks for your time, Steve. I really appreciate it. And also thanks everyone for coming on and listening. Great. See you later, Jen. See you later, Steve. Thank you.